Howdy folks. Just waiting a couple minutes here before we get started. Hi Pam. Tonight's a coffee night. How's everybody doing? I think we can go ahead and start. I'm just uh, waiting a couple minutes to get people logged in. Welcome you to our study for the evening. Um, this is the third portion of this study that we've done. Uh, what's in a psalm? And we've been looking at uh, Psalm 50. <clears throat> Part of the purpose of this was to uh, show uh, there's quite a lot in a psalm. And I, besides that, it's just a good study of this particular psalm, Psalm 50. And um, I just think there's really good relevant points in it. Um, but also just to sort of get across the, the idea that... Uh, you know, not only in the Psalms, but any place you turn in Scripture, there is just a lot of a lot of stuff there, and uh, all of it for our benefit. So, what have we seen so far in Psalm fifty? Um, this this lesson will be the concluding one for the series, but uh, we we looked at how the Psalm is divided up into three thought units, three parts, verses 1 through 6, uh, verses 7 through 15, and then verses 16 through 23, which we'll spend more time on tonight. And it's set up as sort of a courtroom scene. God is calling uh, court into session. And uh, the beginning part, verses 1 through 6, God shows up in court in great power in uh, impressive fashion. And, and then in verses 7 through 15, he addresses the first group that he's concerned with, and the, these are his people, his covenant people. And he talks to them and you know has a, a problem with what, something that's going on with them, and it really has to do with uh, their view of worship. Uh, they were worshiping. They were you know, bringing their sacrifices to the temple and so forth. Um, but they seem to be falling into the pagan idea that they did this because God needed it. So they were serving a need of God in their worship. And God makes it very clear in verses 7 through 15 that God did not need their worship. He wanted it, but he wanted it because they needed to do it. Um, if they hadn't worship, worshipped him, it didn't make him any less God. Uh, but they had this idea, apparently, that, that God somehow needed their worship. So he doesn't tell them to stop worshipping. Uh, there are places in the Old Testament we could look where God, in essence, says, quit coming to the temple. Uh, one text in particular in Isaiah uh, but that's not what he says here. He, he doesn't say stop worshiping, but understand what you're doing. And, um, and, and so that's really sort of the thrust of the first part of this. And he talks in, in that section about how true worshipers are grateful 
they are faithful and that they are people who who rely on God and uh, that it, it isn't about the ritual involved but the relationship with God and he wants to make sure they understand that so the, again that fr that first court section um, is really directed at his people who are already worshiping uh, but they just they they need to understand better what they're doing. And I think we need, as we worship God, to understand what we're doing. The third part in the last section of the psalm begins at verse 16. And it seems like there's a change in audience. Uh, it, it's addressed to the wicked. Now, again, I'll mention that there's two different views of who the wicked are. Are these wicked people in Israel? Um, possibly, or is this the rest of the world outside of God's people? That's also a strong possibility. In fact, I tend toward that, although I'm not sure it changes uh, the basic message. All right, but the, the audience definitely changes. You go from God's uh, faithful covenant people in verses 7 through 15 to whoever the wicked are, in verse 16 through the end of the psalm. So we'll look at what he has to say to this group. Now, as we've done each time, I want to read the psalm here at the beginning. And uh, the first week we read from the English Standard Version. Last week we read really not a, a, a translation, but a paraphrase, the message by Eugene Peterson and his rendering of Psalm 50. I thought we'd do something different again for tonight and uh, uh, read a different translation. This is a really different translation. Uh, it's what is called the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made in the days before Jesus and the Apostles. Um, there was, as, as Greek became the great dominant language of the world at the time, um, they took the Old Testament and translated it into Greek. Because even in Israel, a lot of people read Greek uh, more than they read Hebrew. So um, there became this Greek translation of the Old Testament books called the Septuagint. It was... Um, translated down in Egypt and Alexandria. There was a uh, sort of a mythical story of how it got translated. Um, the term Septuagint actually um, has the word 70 in there, Septuagint, uh, 70. And so there was this myth that um, the uh, when they decided to do the translation, they called together 70 scholars to come down to Alexandria and they put them all in separate rooms and they all uh, translated uh, the Old Testament into Greek and uh, you know didn't collaborate amongst themselves. And then when they brought all those translations together and compared them, they were identical. So it was obviously a sign that God had inspired uh, this translation. Uh, that is not what happened. That is not... Uh, how the Septuagint came to be. It was a more complex process than that. Um, but sometimes when new translations come out, people will um, make up stories about it to make it uh, seem either more or less trustworthy. And that seems to be what happened over time with the Septuagint. Um, it reminds me of, you know, the olden days when there was... Um, a lot of people very devoted to the King James Version and new translations started to come out like the NIV and the RSV and so forth. And a lot of people were very defensive about the, the King James Version because they preferred that and it's a fine translation. Uh, but there were some wars about translations at the time. And there was one group that was so devoted to the King James Version of the Bible that they came up with a theory that when the King James was translated uh, in 1611, uh, that God actually inspired that translation 
re-inspired it. So it was 100% uh, without mistake and, and, and error. Uh, and so even if you could get an original copy of a New Testament book uh, or any Bible book and compare it with the KJV, if the KJV was different, you had to trust it because God had re-inspired it. See, they were arguing for uh, the prominence of the King James. It's sort of a ridiculous view, but there are people who believed it. It's almost like the myth of the translation of the Septuagint. Why is the Septuagint important? Because this was the Bible of uh, the, uh, the, the first century. You know, Jesus, Paul, Peter, the New Testament writers in general, when they quote an Old Testament verse, they're not quoting directly from the original Hebrew. They are quoting the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And that's very clear as you, as you read the New Testament. So that it was their Bible in many ways. And uh, a lot of us are, aren't, aren't familiar with the Septuagint because we you know, we know our English translations. Uh, but it was, you know, to me it's important because if it was the Bible that Paul and, and the Lord and others were familiar with and read from, then I want to know something about it. And in recent years, there have been good English translations of the Septuagint made. So you don't have to know Greek uh, in order to benefit from it. And there was one published just a couple of years ago by um, Lexham Press. And that's what I've got. And I'm going to read Psalm 50 from the Septuagint. And you might think of it as the way that uh, a, a first century Christian may have heard uh, this psalm. It's very similar to what we read in our English translations. So again, Psalm 50, verse 1. God of gods, the Lord spoke and summon the earth from the east and until its setting. From Zion is the goodly appearance of his comeliness. God will come visibly, our God, and he will not keep silent. A fire will burn before him, and around him is a violent storm. He will call the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather to him his holy ones who established his covenant by sacrifice and the heavens will declare his righteousness for God is judge. Hear, O people of mine, and I will speak to you, O Israel. I will warn against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices will I reprove you. Your whole burnt offerings are always before me. I will not accept young bulls from your house, nor male goats from your flocks. For all the beasts of the wood are mine, the livestock in the mountains and cattle. I have known all the birds of the heavens and the beauty of the field is with me. If I am hungry, never ever would I say so to you. For the inhabited world and the fullness of it are mine. I will not eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats, will I? Sacrifice to God a sacrifice of praise and repay to the Most High your vows. Call upon me in the day of tribulation and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. But to the sinner, God said, why do you set out in detail the righteous duties of mine and take up my covenant in your mouth? You hated instruction, and you threw out my words to the rear. If you behold a thief, you run together with him, and you set your portion with adulterers. Your mouth abounds in badness, and your tongue embraces deceit. Seated, you speak against your brother, and you set a trap against the son of your mother. These things you did, and I was silent. You wrongly thought that I would be like you. I will reprove you and be present against your face. Understand indeed these things, you who forget God, lest he seize you and there be no one who can rescue you. 
A sacrifice of praise will glorify me, and there is a way by which I will show him the salvation of God. So again, if you came in sort of in the middle of that, that was the, uh, the, the 50th Psalm in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, now translated into English for our benefit. So again, uh, this last section, verses 16 through 20, Three, uh, now the wicked are called up in court. And as I reflected on, on these verses, it just reminded me again of our theme, what's in a psalm, but really in any scripture, it's a great example of how relevant and how current uh, this ancient book is. It's amazing. Um, we're talking about, you know, something written thousands of years ago, but if you think about it in the right way, it could have been composed, you know, in 2021, because to me, it's some of the exact same kind of things going on right now. So consider this for a moment. When you think about our laws, what are our law, our laws ultimately based on um, our law system um, that the founding fathers of our country uh, put together. You know, there's a chain that goes back. If you trace it far enough back, you, you find God's law. I mean, you find the law of Moses, um, the law of the Old Testament behind many of the laws that we still um, abide by today. And, and so... Uh, that, that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind. Our ideas of what's right and what's wrong, where do those come from? Did, that, did they just pop into our mind uh, or are they based on something? Again, you trace almost all of them back to the words and the law of God. And what happens over time is that people sort of pick and choose the laws that they approve of. You know, well, that's why we have jails. <laughs> uh, and uh, some people do this and they, they're not jailed. Uh, but people sort of, you know, they have those laws, that they all abide by that, but that one not so much. And that sort of changes with uh, the season and 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 through the decades and the centuries, you know what laws fall into and out of our favor as a people. Uh, our minds change over time. Uh, but but how does God feel about this? Uh, how does the author of law? and right and wrong, the ultimate author, how does he feel about this way that we treat his, his commands? Well, if you look again at the beginning of this part, verse 16, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips. Sounds like God is upset there with people. And, and so you, you think of a situation where people are sort of picking and choosing um, what, what law they'll honor and obey and what they won't. And God comes along and says, um, what right do you have to pick and choose? What right have you to recite my statutes, the ones you like, okay, what are some of the laws that people like today? Well, we, we're we concerned about justice and treating people right and fairness and, and uh, equity and equality and things like that, which we should be because God's law is certainly concerned about that. All right, but then there are certain things that God said to do and not to do that have fallen out of favor, right? Uh, certain uh, moral laws, 
uh, about the way we behave and interact with one another uh, are no longer popular and, and are thrown away in the minds of a lot of people. So God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? That is those parts of it that you think are good and prefer because originally it's all from God. What right have you to quote part of it and enforce part of it, but not the parts you don't like? Verse 17, God continues, for you hate discipline. What's, what's discipline? It's, it's God's training of his people. Um, and that means sometimes there are things he says that we don't like that we, we need to buckle under and obey. He trains us. He disciplines us. But God says here, you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. So there's parts of what I say and teach you that you just toss away the parts you don't like. And then there's some parts that, yeah, you're good with, uh, but what right have you to quote part and not all is sort of the idea. You hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. Verse 18, if you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. So there are a couple in uh, a couple of laws there in um, you know the original ancient context here that that God says yeah you're okay with somebody that steals of course one of the original commandments was don't steal uh, but he says if you see a thief you're pleased with him and I think most people today uh, like that law. They don't like being stolen from. Um, sure, we have thieves, but in general, people are okay with, with thou shalt not steal. Uh, but God uses this as an example. You, if you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. You hang out with adulterers. Now there's one today that's, that's not near as popular. Um, the law against adultery. And so, um, that's, you know, ripped out of our headlines. And God says, you know, you're, you're hanging out with people who do that. Uh, verse 19, you give your mouth free reign for evil. So you say whatever you want to say, even if it's wicked. And your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Um, just sort of fighting within families or maybe between friends, brothers, and sisters, that kind of thing. Uh, so you see what he does here. He, he begins by saying, uh, what right do you have to be quoting um, my truths, my laws, when the ones you don't like, you just throw away, you toss behind you. And then he gives some examples uh, of, of some of the laws that they weren't observing and didn't like. But really, there in verses 17 through 20, we could fill in and, and sort of do our own little paraphrase there. We could fill in whatever the currently approved sin or perversion is in our time that, that people say, oh, I, I don't like that law. I'd rather be able to do what I want to do. Um, we could fill in whatever it might be in our time that people approve of that God does not. Um, to make it uh, really uh, apply to our times. But it all comes back again, as we said each week, to what we find in verse 21. That's the kicker. And so this is the key, I think, to the whole psalm and to the message here. God says, these things you have done. All right, what are these things? Uh, you're picking and choosing my laws you like and don't like. You're throwing away, away the ones you don't like. But then you, you quote the ones you like. All right. These things you have done, and I have been silent, God says in verse 21. Now, how do you interpret the silence of God? 
So you know, here we are in 2021, and for how long have people been picking and choosing what, what uh, morals and laws and teachings of God they will observe or not observe? Well, for thousands of years, right? And they haven't necessarily always received immediate punishment. You know, we think of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament where God destroyed those cities for their wickedness. Uh, we don't see that kind of thing a lot. Uh, somebody, for instance, steals something. Since he mentions thieves in verse 18, somebody steals something. We don't see them drop dead necessarily. Um, they may be caught, tried, and put in jail. Uh, that usually takes a long time. So there are, is some punishment in, in, this, in this life, but we might think, oh, that's just uh, the, the police or the government punishing them. God's not really involved. Uh, God says to them, these things you have done and I have been silent. How do we interpret God's silence? God's silence on, on things like this. Is it, uh, do we interpret it or can it be interpreted as meaning that he doesn't care about it? That is, if, if I violate God's law, whatever it is, uh, and nothing happens to me, you know, I steal and I get away with it, nothing happens to me, God doesn't strike me dead. Uh, does it mean God doesn't care? That's what some would assume, especially after centuries and millennia of people acting like this. God says, I, you've done these things, I've been silent. Does that mean he doesn't care? Well, that's a possibility that some, some people might suggest. Or another way to interpret God's silence on things like this is he's being patient. Is it possible that God is being patient and as a result being very loving? That is not wanting to instantly zap a person when they violate his law. And, and his truths, uh, to give them a chance to learn better, uh, to repent, that kind of thing. There's a couple of different ways you could interpret God's silence. You could say he doesn't care. You could say he's being patient. Notice what it goes on and says there in verse 21 then. Uh, these things you have done and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. Uh, again, each time we've opened the psalm up, we've, we've underlined that particular line saying that's the key. Uh, the error that they're making is that God, they think God is like them. So, if you think God is like you and he's silent, you might well think, well, he doesn't care. I can do whatever I want. If I want to be a thief and I don't get struck down, then it's okay to be a thief. God doesn't care. Or an adulterer. Or uh, if I want to talk bad about somebody or speak against my brother, whatever it is. Or you fill in. Uh, the violation of God's truth, it might be. If you think God's just like you, you might well interpret his silence as he doesn't care what, what I do. Um, but God says here, that was a mistake. You thought I was just like you. And he goes on and says, but now... I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Verse 21. God saying, I'm not like you. And you need to understand that my silence is not to be interpreted as being that I don't care or that I won't hold you responsible. Uh, 
If God does care, but is patient, thus silent, and if that means he loves, then what do we need to do? The close of the psalm answers that question. He says in verse 22, Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. It's almost like in the, the, the uh, section that we looked at last week where they, they were worshiping God but had a basic misunderstanding that they needed to correct. It's almost the same with the wicked here. Um, they have this misunderstanding that God, because he has been silent, uh, in effect, puts his stamp of approval on however they want to live. And he, he says here, you, you need to understand this. Mark this, you forgetters of God, lest I tear you apart. You see, the judgment is coming. It's indeed coming. And you need to understand that. Don't misinterpret my silence. Um, God's, God's silence and patience uh, is a sign of his love and it's an opportunity to change, to repent before it's too late, uh, before we're torn. The picture is, is God almost like a lion um, getting ready to, to, to pounce and destroy the prey. Uh, and so that's, that's a powerful image. Psalm closes, verse 23, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. God wants thankful people. It's, a, it's the second time he's mentioned that um, in the psalm. And he wants to save those people. He wants thankful people and he wants to save those people. But there is this warning here in verse 22 that he will tear them if they don't change. Now, this isn't just uh, an Old Testament God or an Old Testament idea. I wanted to conclude by reminding the same thing is repeated in the New Testament. So, for instance, in a place like 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 14, Peter is finishing up his writings in the New Testament and he says, he's been talking really about the, the day of judgment in Second Peter 3. As, as he gets toward the conclusion of that, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you were waiting for these, that is the day of the Lord's return, <clears throat> be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. <clears throat> Excuse me. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. That sounds very much like what we've read in Psalm 50, isn't it? Uh, you thought, the psalmist, God, God through the psalmist said, you thought because I was silent um, that I was like you. And so you did whatever you wanted to do was was the basic message and God says no that's not I'm not like you and I will hold you responsible if you don't straighten out then Peter says to people after he sort of described what the end of the world's going to be like he says okay folks now we need to really be diligent to be faithful to remain without spot or blemish and count understand that God's patience that is his silence his waiting, his waiting, regard that as salvation, as an opportunity uh, to make sure we're ready. I think this, again, this is something, this, this psalm and these texts uh, could have been written uh, in 2021. I see, I see this so much, not only from totally worldly people, but there's so much in religious circles, in, in Christianity today, 
where people are just sort of blending in with the culture and and saying that you know God didn't really mean what he said about the way we're supposed to live um, and he didn't really mean what he said about how one is saved or or how we are to live in the church of God. And so we can do whatever we want to do. And they're misinterpreting God's silence um, as him not really caring what we do. I think people will find that to be a great mistake. And it's one of the, God is, is, is uh, he is not like us. He is other than us. And this Psalm reminds us of that. And um, it's, it's an incredible reminder of God's love because he could have done like the days of Noah when uh, he brought immediate pun punishment, destroyed the world for its sin. But remember when Noah came out of the ark, God made that promise, I'm not gonna do this again in this way. And so we've had all these thousands of years since the time of Noah and we don't know when the Lord's returning. Uh, every generation assumes it's gonna be right uh, in their lifetime. We don't know. The world may go on for millennia more. That may be God's wisdom, but we should never interpret God's silence to mean he doesn't care what we're doing and that he won't hold people responsible because he most certainly will just as much a part of God's nature is, is his justice and his righteousness as is his love and grace and mercy. Those, those, we have to hold those things all together and not emphasize one over the other. And uh, Psalm 50 is, is a great psalm to remind us of that. So what's in a psalm? I hope you've seen uh, the, that there's a lot and uh, appreciate you being a part of our study. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us in every way you have today and for or just providing um, a day of life in your world. We, we thank you for the words that we've been able to, to read from your word and help us to be faithful to them now. I pray your blessing on all those that have um, been a part of the study this evening or whenever they're able to log in and participate. Pray your blessings on our world and help us to be faithful with your word, uh, to believe what it says and to share it with others. And most of all, uh, be faithful to the word made flesh, your son, our savior, Jesus. And we pray in his name, amen.